What's going on everybody? So welcome back to the God Eater Lore series. It's been a little bit since the last episode and um, if you guys watched one of my previous videos, God Eater 3 has ended with the Ein character episode. So if you're unaware, God Eater 3 actually gave us multiple updates which added on to the base story. They added about two standalone pieces and then from there they went ahead and gave us character episodes for everybody that's aboard the Chrysanthemum. While these character episodes focus on our individual team members' backstory, they do actually progress the overarching story as well. Each iteration of Guider added in a sort of unique or new system. Guider 3 basically enhanced the whole burst concept and we got a new feature called Engage. An elementary definition of this whole Engage concept is as you could say bonds through a close relationship with your partners you're able to now share what they call the burst plugins essentially it's a little bit of a plugin or a boost that gets activated after doing a certain amount of actions or should i just say devouring a certain amount of times and so whenever you then engage with your partners you can now share your burst plugins and this also translates to online so you engage with someone that you're playing with You'll be able to share and use their burst plugin for a set amount of time. So we start this episode at the beginning of update 2.0, which introduces something called Core Engage. Keith, give him a quick breakdown of what's going on. With pleasure. Let me try to say this in plain English. When two God Eaters have a deep enough psychological connection to each other, they'll be able to engage together in harmony. It's called a core engage a core engage and the reason that i'm explaining all this is because it makes more sense of why we have what we are calling or what they called character episodes by strengthening our bond we're able to increase the power of our engage turning it into a core engage the residence area contains a person's combat experience and other deep personal memories and the catch here is it requires two people an observer to connect to the residence area of that person and then the observee who's going to create it and so with this update 2.0 all the way down to the last update 2.50 we enter all of our teammates residence areas so starting with 2.0 we begin with claire and the reason why we start with claire is they wanted to start the testing on a normal god eater before going into an age each of the characters that we learn more about essentially have one big piece of their past that they're hiding. So for Claire, her brother and father had died, and essentially she felt very guilty about it. The way that these character episodes panned out was essentially we had an initial dive into their memory, got a few bits and pieces of, of their past, and then from there we had to increase our resonance sync rate. And the way we did that was going on missions with a specific partner. So at the start of Claire's backstory, we learn that bandits attacked her port and killed her father, and then her brother went missing in the Ashlands. Losing two people I loved, one after the other. I never even imagined that could happen. But it turned out that this was just what she was told, and the real truth was something that she thought she didn't know, but more so was hiding it from herself when we're on the verge of continuing entering her residence area and learning of her true past claire falls into a coma after this core engage session due to her brain activity spiking and forcing us to disconnect claire is still in a coma during the mission her brain activity started spiking, and you went through a forced disconnect. I'm not sure, but Claire may have consciously pushed you out of the resonance area. But there's no sign that Claire herself disconnected. Her consciousness is still deep in the resonance area. That's my hypothesis, at least. And this essentially happened because she was nervous and scared of her own past, and she really didn't want us, the player, to see it. So by making a copy of her residence area through the archiving of that data, we're able to now re-enter into the residence area, find her, and essentially pull her out. In between the core engaged sessions, 
Claire has a recurring dream that she sees her brother and her father arguing. And this was due to Claire's father being an influential figure in Glebnir under the House of Victorious, and this led to Edric tricking Claire. We learn of the true cause of her father and brother's death, that being that Edric tells Claire to tell her dad to meet him behind a shed. From there, he kills her dad and runs off. After wondering what's going on for some time, Claire goes behind the shed and finds her dad dead. Claire is the last member of House Victorious, and through this, she feels that she needs to bring honor to their name. I was finally able to face my own past because you were there with me. I became a God Eater only to deceive myself and simply pretended to carry on my family name. Now I can uphold the House of Victorious in my own way, with my own will. I owe you so much. Thank you. Through this whole self-examination that she goes through, she understands that it's not about just blindly trying to bring honor to House Victorious. It's more about being her own best self. She stopped believing in the ideal of her family and started to believe in what it actually meant. I went into a little bit more detail than I initially expected, but at least with that, it gives you an idea of kind of how back and forth these character episodes were being fleshed out. So moving forward, we'll go a bit more summary based. And so to start that off, we begin with version 2.10, which gives us Hugo in Zeke's character episode. During his time in prison at Pennywort, Hugo thought only of bettering life for himself, his friends, and family. It wasn't until he was rescued by Hilda in the Chrysanthemum that he finds out firsthand just how powerless he really is, and the realization dawns on him of just how much his dream will require kindness and the power of others. We were pretty brazen, weren't we? The way we negotiated with Hilda like that? Looking back, how could a couple of kids with no real accomplishments talk like that? Think about it for a second. From Hilda's perspective, you and Feem alone might have been enough to destroy the Ashborn. But in the end, the deal worked out entirely in our favor. Now we can brag that we're equal business partners. But I still feel like we owe her a lot, honestly. During the time that he put a plan together in order to rescue Feem and Inukai, which landed the Hounds a ticket to the Fenrir HQ Reclamation Initiative, he finally gets a shot to make a name for himself until the governor general's announcement and demand that all ages sacrifice themselves to power Odin robs him of any hope and for a brief moment he begins to accept his fate. <laughs> I made a fool of myself didn't I? I always say we won't die but I ended up thinking about my own death. The Governor General's announcement almost made me give up on our dream, but Hilda offered us a lifeboat, and you gave me the push I needed. That's what kept me from giving up. But what Hugo came later to realize, that his depression, his fear of losing everything, was only because of how close his dreams were, and how afraid he was of losing the things he held dear which was now within reach. And by the end of his character episode, Hugo reveals that his new plan or his new dream is to build ports all over the world and not just one and not just across Europe, but Hugo wants to make his dream a reality for everyone in the world. The thing is, I have this big new dream. Are you willing to hear me out? First off, where would you want to build the port? Ah, I see. Not a bad idea. As for me, let's see. Here. Or here. Here would be good too. And this area has its strengths. Up until now, we wanted to build a place where we could spend our lives as we saw fit. 
but thinking about it, there are countless people out there searching for hope like us. We're trying to build a port, but just one port won't be enough. I want to build ports all over Europe. In fact, all over the world where people can be safe. I didn't have a chance to talk about this until now. Back then, five of us, Neil, Keith, me, and our two older brothers lived together. This was before Pennyward. Our older brothers seemed like parents to us, since we never knew our actual parents. Older brothers named Saul and Reese. They taught Zeke everything that he knew, but when he lost them on a mission, they made him promise one thing. No matter what, protect Neil and Keith. However, when Neil was sold to another port by Pennyworth's corrupt higher-ups, and Keith wasn't much of a combat god-eater, Zeke began to immensely worry that he wouldn't be able to keep his promise. I swore an oath to my brothers, but I couldn't keep it. It's always eaten at me. I kept thinking that I should have done more to keep Neil safe when he was sold off. Wasn't that my responsibility as his big brother? Now that the three brothers are reunited, Zeke makes a new promise, both to Neil and Keith, to himself and to Saul and Reese. He stops running away from his insecurities about his past failures, renewing his vow to protect Neith and kill no matter what. Is that what this is all about? You've always put too much of a burden on yourself. What? Saul and Reese told us something a long time ago. Zeke has a huge sense of duty, so the two of you need to help keep him on his feet. What? They told you that? Oh, wow. That makes a lot of sense. Those two were always worried about you, Zeke. We have you to thank for where we are today. Both of us. So stop worrying about us, okay? Keith and I went out exploring and we found data for the latest season of Booga Rally. We thought we'd watch it once you were back. The data analysis should be done soon. You guys... How? How could you keep something like that from me? Uh, I mean, you had a whole lot going on and... We kind of wanted to surprise you. Morons! You know that the latest season of Booga Rally is more important than any of this! The thrill of discovery, the, the tension of the analysis, that's all part of Booga Rally! Well, to keep this a secret from your big brother who looked after you all those years! Neil! Keith! As punishment for this, no Booga Rally for either of you! The latest season goes to the eldest first! So as I briefly mentioned at the start of this episode, while we did get individual backstories, at the end of each of these updates we got a small piece that was more about the entire story of God Eater itself. So at the end of version 2.10, we learn about the Calamity. Oh well, yeah. Today is Remembrance Day for the Calamity. Remember? Hmm, how do I put this? It's a day where we remember and try to comfort the spirits of those lost in the calamity. When the Ashlands came, countless people died, and many are still losing their lives today. We offer prayers on this day, hoping that those lost may rest a little more peacefully. Have you ever heard the story of the Three Sages of the Calamity? The details are obscure, but rumors never stop traveling, even in days like these. They say three brilliant scientists caused the Calamity by accident in an experiment. Goes to Heidenstam, a master of transmission engineering. Josiah Kwan, an authority on nanomachines. And lastly, an expert on retro oracle cells, and also the very first God Eater, Soma Shiksaw.
No one knows what became of these horrific criminals. Not even if they're dead or alive. There are no records or witnesses. Most people assume everything was covered up by their supporters. I don't know. But they caused the greatest disaster in history. They can't have escaped unscathed. Only the perpetrators can tell you that. The experiment was on an unprecedented scale. Their purpose had to have been something huge. Horrific criminals. Bad guys? Hmm. It's strange to say this, but... We're here today because the calamity happened. I like to look to the future rather than lament the past. Let's keep up the fight. Version 2.20 was a bit interesting, simply because of the two character episodes that we got. We got our new waifu contender, Lulu, and a dude that did almost nothing throughout the entirety of this game, uh, Ricardo. Contrary to Ricardo feeling semi-irrelevant, I was actually interested to understand what his whole purpose was on the chrysanthemum. We're going to start with Lulu. All Lulu can remember about her childhood at Port Baron is her tutelage under Go Baron, who we learned throughout the main story was her master. As far as Lulu is concerned, he was a heartless man who cast aside all emotion on the battlefield and didn't actually care for his fallen students, which we learned he had many of. My master was from the Far East. He introduced me to Odin, a dish from that region. <laughs> the Odin he made wasn't very good, though, so I decided to make him Odin he'd like, in exchange for an answer to a question. Did he remember the students he'd lost? And this whole time, all she's wanted for ages was to find out where Go's heart truly lay. And for Lulu, being younger at the time, Death was just not easy for her to forget about, yet it seemed like Go did it so effortlessly. Being able to recall her memory, she does come to terms that Go truly did care. So from here, Lulu vows to find him one day, so that she might be able to fulfill the promise that she made. So in this same update, we have Ricardo's character episode. Prior to the Calamity, when Glutmir was still an army belonging to Fenrir HQ, Carter was a young, idealistic gladiator who wanted nothing more to be a hero and defend humanity. It wasn't until a disastrous mission that involved him losing all his comrades due to an unidentified and unexpected origami showing up that he lost all of his comrades, fled, and left them all to die. From there, he became a wandering mercenary before settling at a Fedra satellite base. Soon after that, he met Hilda, who is the owner of Port Chrysanthemum, and Werner, who is the former leader of the Crimson Queen, who, if you remember, sacrificed himself during the last events of the game. Both of these two individuals proposed the idea of ports as a means to support frontline god eaters. So, through Ricardo's character episode, we do actually learn that Hilda and Werner were the main people with the idea to invent ports. Hilda Enriquez and Warner Gadolin. As you know, they were together as students who shared the same dream. The focus of their studies was building an underground base impervious to origami attacks. Sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? Yep, their research turned into reality in the form of ports and kept a lot of people safe. Obviously, Glepner did the building and construction and all that, but it was Hilda and Werner's idea. On the day of the Ashfall, Ricardo's satellite base that he had began living in was in a direct route to where all the origami were rushing towards. Ricardo mentions that during the day of the Calamity, 
many ash storms formed and origami habitats began to rapidly change. And at that point, there was really no hope for anyone. Contrary to how Ricardo was previously, he did not want to give up what he loved once again. But Warner and Hilda prevented Ricardo from staying behind to defend his satellite base. Anyway, the satellite base was destroyed, and Warner and the owner saved me. I barely escaped with my life. After that, uh, I don't really remember much. But since the Governor General's son, Warner, was there, rescue teams from Gleipnir came running. And the owner and Warner? The light was gone from the eyes of those once happy dreamers. Somehow I knew that the spark would never return to them. But the one thing he and Hilda still had in common was the desire to follow their dreams. And due to it being a shared desire, coupled with Ricardo's willingness to lay it all on the line for his comrades that she witnessed on the Day of Calamity, it prompted Hilda to bring him on as a member of Port Chrysanthemum. You're right. There were others who could have helped me establish my port. But I knew you have something that none of the others had. What could that be? The willingness to defend your home with your life. <sighs> On the day of the Calamity, Werner and I would have died if you hadn't been there. I'll never forget how you tried to stay there, even though it'd mean your own death. You gave me the courage to make my dream a reality then. It's interesting how these character episodes are a bit of a mix between entirely personal and then some that actually explain a bit more of what happened in the past for Guided Theory. So as we can see, Ricardo's character episode helped us to understand a bit more about the Calamity. And following this newfound light on events during the Calamity, we come to the end of version 2.20. Come on, work with me. If this deal doesn't go through, they'll get rid of me for sure. Just get me intel on that adaptive armor stuff the hounds have. That's all. We'll split the reward. 70-30. Deal? This again? How many times do I have to tell you? I'm not interested in any deals with you. Huh? It's not like you're getting nothing. With my connections and Baron's money, we'll be able to mass produce it way faster than them. Besides, you're the one who wants to make ultra long distance voyages so bad. What good does it do you to help out a bunch of snot nosed brats like that? <laughs> You'd never understand. Soma Shiksal. I found something interesting recently. There were some images in a pre-calamity data server salvaged from the Ashlands. The AI analysis said it was one of the three sages of the calamity, Soma Shiksal. A striking resemblance, wouldn't you say? What about it? I don't think it's just a coincidence. I looked up your history. There was nothing fishy, clean as can be. But if people who trust you saw this, well, do you think they'd still treat you the same? <laughs> do whatever you want. Bastard. Stuck up punk. Just you wait. You and all of the others. I'll bring you down together. We now enter into version 2.30. Version 2.30 was a bit different where the only character episode that they added was Fee. And due to the sheer length and robustness of Ayn's backstory, I decided to take Neil, Keith, and Soma, or should I say Ayn's backstory, 
and make that its own standalone episode, as we just really need to flesh out Ayn's backstory. So, entering into version 2.30, Fiend was very eager to be the next observee for the core engage testing, but Keith reveals that she strangely lacks a resonance area. Undeterred, Keith supposes that Fiend must still have a resonance sync rate, so he suggests that the protagonist accompany Fiend on missions to boost it while helping her write reports about the members of the Hounds as a little bit of a homework assignment. Through this we have a few wholesome moments of Fiend, like this one where she explains all of the dreams that she has. Good to see you. So, Fiend, how about telling me about that dream of yours? Sure! Um, well, I want to be a teacher. Oh, that's an excellent dream! You're a smart girl. I'm sure you can do it. Yeah, helping kids is a great goal. You study hard, so you'll be just fine. But I can't do division yet. Will I really be able to become a teacher? Don't worry. You're already ahead of Zeke. G come on! I know how to do basic math. Mostly. Oh, and there are other dreams I have. And what are they? I want to learn how to cook, and I want to be a doctor. And I want to make picture books, and s study more about god arts. One day, when I'm grown up, I want to help everyone's dreams come true. That's why I want to learn how to do so many things, for everyone's sake. When we learn about Feem giving her reports to her class at school, she explains how she's confronted by classmates who tell her that the devil of the chrysanthemum surely cannot be her parent. If you forget, um, the protagonist or, you know, us who are playing the game was referred to as a devil of chrysanthemum because of how strong we were. The classmates also say that being an origami, she surely cannot have a family. Thankfully, Neil comes in to comfort and reassure her saying that the only family that matters is the family you choose and the family that you're willing to fight to protect. Fiend takes this to heart, coming to hold the hounds and the crew of the chrysanthemum as her true family and vowing to live her life, doing everything she can to protect them. From here, we are taken to a cutscene at the completion of version 2.30. And just as a reminder, throughout Guide Eater 3 base story, we do see Ayn have some complications where he's having some pains and so in this cutscene we see those sort of symptoms worsening. Shit crazy. All right. Shut up. Everyone shut up. Oh god. and everyone loved her. Did they? Are you having fun at school? Yeah! But two boys got in a fight at school recently. They cried a lot. They looked so sad. I see. The origami inside you is crying like a little child, too. It seems sad. Uh. And it seems in a hurry somehow. You're sharp. You might be right. It's always been with you, hasn't it? Yeah. When did it start crying? Around the time the Ash Tempest incident calmed down. Be my fault? 
Not at all. It's my fault. All the blame lies with me. Sorry to make you worry. Keep this secret from your daddy, okay? So, with that being said, we have come to an end for this episode. Like I mentioned before, the next episode will have Keith, Neil, and Soma. Be sure to subscribe, leave a like if you enjoyed, and you really don't want to miss the next episode. So, hope you guys enjoyed, and I'll see you all in the next video. Peace.